Great. All right. So uh, welcome, everybody. Happy to be here. Um, I'm Michael Casey. I'm the Chief Content Officer at Coindesk. Um, I, just to give a little bit of background, I sort of am, have been engaged in the sustainable blockchain space for a while, though, because before joining Coindesk, I was at MIT at the Digital Currency Initiative, where I worked on some solar initiatives uh, in relation to uh, funding distributed solar projects in Puerto Rico and elsewhere. So it's always been a passion of mine. Uh, so I'm very happy. Thank you, Mark, for dragging me back into this space. Um, also, just as a, a plug, um, the Money Reimagined podcast that I do weekly with Sheila Warren, formerly of the World Economic Forum, now of the, uh, the, the Council for Crypto Innovation, um, we founded uh, an event, a, a, a body called the Crypto Sustainability Impact Accelerator, or CESA, at the World Economic Forum to really sort of bring multi-stakeholder arrangements together to, to work on the kinds of solutions that uh, are being discussed here today. So that's my own little pitch, you know, follow up on those things. It's all in, all in a good cause. Um, why don't we just go down the line, you guys. Harrison, you know, introduce yourself, uh, tell, tell everybody what, uh, what you're all about. Sure, yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Harrison at Coinbase. I do a lot of sort of impact stuff and venture stuff. Right. Adam? Yeah. I'm Adam Wiedemann. I'm with uh, Microsoft's blockchain group. Uh, uh, I've only started there uh, uh, recently, but, but the group has been for a long time building out the uh, blockchain infrastructure to start putting uh, more data on chain. And so conversations like this are ones that we are really interested in. Hi all, I'm Alex de Vries. I'm the founder of Digi Economist, and you probably know it from the Bitcoin Energy Consumption Index. Steve. Oh God, I'm John Milby. So this is the first meeting of the Alan Ransell, uh, Doug Miller fan club, I think. Um, <laughs> and I'm very pleased to be here. I'm Stephen Haft, and I work at Consensus. All right, there you go. It is an all-star panel, guys. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Uh, alrighty, so I mean, I just said maybe we just started off uh, on some high level stuff and then we can drill down into, you know, use cases and the like. But um, Alan pointed out the, um, the EO, the, the Biden EO, and I thought it was just like a, a nice way to start here, right? There, there seems to be, uh, and I was very pleased to see it, an acknowledgement that this isn't just a threat, that there is actually something really constructive that can be done uh, with blockchain technology. So. I suppose my challenge to all of you was like, okay, so the administration wants solutions that are climate friendly. Um, what do we tell them? Like, what is, what is the message to the world right now about how blockchain can be constructive rather than you know, this, this sort of horrible threat that everyone seems to talk about? Why don't you give a shot at that quickly, Harrison? Yeah, um, you said sort of something really interesting in our, in our green room, as it were, that we, we can't just lead with sticks, we have to lead with carrots. And I think that there's an opportunity here to bring uh, carbon on-chain, which is a lot of the work that I focus on, um, to sort of create a secondary market, and instead of being punitive, more of like a rewarding system. And so creating, a, like, you know, incentivizing uh, more clean energy or different sequestration methods or that sort of thing. Yeah, great. Uh, no, I, I, I certainly agree with all of that. The, um, uh, additionally, part of the challenge is how do we bring about transparency? And... Uh, uh, Although that seems really easy, like, oh, well, we'll just put all the information on the blockchain. Uh, as it turns out, uh, there's a lot of, uh, of uh, company secrets that they don't want on the blockchain, specifically around uh, their manufacturing processes. And so how do we, how do we both be transparent as well as uh, preserve confidentiality? Uh, there are absolutely ways to do that, but uh, they are non-trivial. And so uh, a lot of our focus uh, moving forward in this, this next year is how we make that a reality. Thoughts, Alex? Yeah, I think that when we're talking about blockchain, we need to keep in mind that we're not talking about the Bitcoin blockchain necessarily. That's what a lot of people think about when we mention the word blockchain. They all think, hey, Bitcoin and Bitcoin energy intensive, bad. So how can we possibly use that for doing something good for the climate? But the thing is, most blockchain platforms don't run on the same uh, energy intensive mining algorithm that Bitcoin is using. So it's not fair and representative for the rest of the space. So I think that is a, a, a good one to start with. Uh, and let's keep in mind that we have more sustainable ways to do blockchain than Bitcoin is doing. And we can leverage that to do something good for the world. Well said. Nicely done. <laughs> uh, it seems to me 
that the challenge is not just that the technology does what it can do, because we in this room are not the technology, we are the stewards of a technology. And so the question is whether we as stewards are doing our job to help administer this ecosystem that we would like to define as a uh, trust layer for the planet, uh, are we doing it in a trustworthy way? And it seems to me that we need to aspire to live up to uh, our obligations in the space. And to do that, you know, I, I like the thought of going back to fundamentals in we're very much of Ethereum focused at consensus, as, as I think everyone in the room knows. And uh, we, we, we share roots there. And, uh, but in the root sharing of it all, in 2015, when Ethereum was created, that very same year, that very same summer, the Paris Accords were created. Mm -hmm. And I believe as, uh, and, and you're going to accuse me of over-intellectualizing this, but I don't, I don't think so. I think, I think roots are important. Uh, much like the French Revolution and the American Revolution shared ideas that came from Locke and Rousseau, I think we share ideas of transparency and uh, 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 the end of uh, uh, financial duplicity and things very much. Our technology and the Paris Accord share those ideas. And, uh, and so I would say that the charge is for us as stewards to restore an alignment that uh, I, I think has, has genuineness from those early days of, uh, of blockchain to, uh, to re restore going forward that alignment with the ideals of the, the Paris Accords and take that seriously as stewards. Great. I've just uh, changed my structure of where this conversation is going to go. <laughs> Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, I, I was going to do softballs to you all and get you a chance to say, uh, here's what, can, here's what uh, Coinbase is doing, here's what Microsoft is doing, et cetera, et cetera. But no, we're going to do the how do we be good stewards conversation. I think this is an excellent place to start because it feeds into some of the stuff that you talk about, Alex, like what is the right blockchain? How do we deal with energy consumption? How do we get the right balance, right, between what is this doing good for the world, the ultimate solutions. And then the fact that, you know, there's a lot about our space that isn't necessarily driving society in that right direction, right? So um, it's a, just a call to action, you know? Um, so yeah, Harrison, I mean, you, you guys, you've got a, a broad portfolio of, of ventures. You're one of the biggest players in crypto. You, in some respects, are, uh, you have a moral obligation to set the standard here. You're Coinbase, right? So, yeah. so what do you, how do you take that message and, how does it feed into how you go about where you invest, what you do as a company, and, and, and just as importantly, what you signal to the outside world as, as your responsibilities and obligations? That's a fantastic question. Um, our climate practice is pretty nascent right now, um, which is me and maybe two other people, depending on how you count them. Um, you might need to be bigger. It might be three <laughs> or it might be one. <laughs> yeah. Depending on how we spend our days. Um, so at least from my perspective, it's all about like what are the highest leverage things that we can do? And there's so much excellent work being done in the space. I mean, I'm, I'm repping a Toucan shirt, you know, and like they're bringing carbon on chain and one of the foremost players there. Um, and I think a lot of our focus right now is just empowering other people to... As, as you said, like become stewards and create the right incentive mechanisms uh, to create carrots, not sticks. And I hope that with the executive order, like we'll, we'll have more of that. Um, it won't just all be completely punitive. And I keep coming back to that because, you know, I got my certain blockchain analytics and I'm kind of afraid of that, but uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's yet to be seen. Well, you, you, you can be sure that the, the, the administration, the regulator is going to, <laughs> going to demand, right? That there are yeah. standards that are being set here. It's not just yeah. going to take you know, at blind faith, these, you know, utopian promises, right? Yeah. So I think that's, that's a really, it's almost like a, um, it's, it's keeping us honest, right? Which I think is important. Adam, yes, I mean, again, you guys have got, how do you think about this from, from what you invest in and what, what, you, what projects you, you develop? Sure. So, um, uh, th I mean, this is something that Microsoft is, uh, in, is very committed to. Uh, we have a $1 billion fund specifically uh, to invest in uh, sustainable uh, practices for uh, carbon capture and, and carbon reduction. Um, uh, and and so, so we are very committed to this, and I love the urgency in this room around it 
because uh, that's uncommon, and I feel like I've found my tribe. Um, but the uh, uh, al independent of, of what blockchain you're, you're running on, um, as, as Alan brought up, that those chains run on something. And if I were to put my Microsoft glasses on, uh, we would hope that it would run on Azure. Uh, and, uh, and to that end, we've been making strong uh, uh, progress towards our goal of being uh, completely uh, uh, running off of renewable uh, energy in all of our data centers by 2025. And that's only three years away. So there's a lot of work uh, that, that we've got to do uh, to get there. But, but we, are, we are aggressively moving towards it. Um, and so, so, so that's, that's the first part. How do, we, uh, how do we make what we're doing today in crypto more sustainable? But beyond that, how do we, how do we really take a, um, uh, a data-backed approach to tackling uh, scope three emissions? Right, scope three emissions, which is, for those who don't uh, know, that's, that's everything upstream and downstream of, uh, of, of the thing that you're actually producing, right? And so are we responsible for, um, for uh, devices and energy uses once it's in a consumer's hand and out of ours? Well, yes, yes we are. Uh, but the only way that we can take a practical approach to that is, is by having uh, some very mature data practices with respect to uh, understanding what uh, uh, the, the actual impacts are of the decisions that we make far upstream, right? And, and knowing those now so that we uh, were able to predict and appropriately um, uh, make decisions that have a benefit uh, downstream. Okay, um, I want, really want to get to the scope three emissions because I think it's an interesting, it, it not only just an important challenge, but I think it also in some respects speaks to the, some of the stuff that Alan was talking about, the sort of the sheer impossibility of measuring these ecosystems with these outdated tools, right? So that once you talk about the different stages of a supply chain, the world becomes incredibly complex. Um, and so we'll get to that, but let's stick with this for the moment. Let's get to the blockchain, which blockchain, what type of consensus algorithm conversation, because Alex, that's you know, something that you've brought a lot of attention to. Um, you know, would you, you know, you've been a very outspoken critic of, of uh, Bitcoin and its energy consumption. Um, what should the community be doing in response to that? How do we, how do we deal with that? I mean, I, I don't personally think Bitcoin's gonna go away anywhere. Um, and in fact, there's an argument to say that if we were to shut it down in one place, it would simply move to an even dirtier place, right? And the, you mentioned Kazakhstan, that may be an example of that, right? So how do we deal with this, right? How do we, and, and with this conversation of carrots versus sticks, what's your take on, let's start with proof of work and then we'll bring Steve in to talk a little bit about Ethereum and its migration. Um, how do we deal with the Bitcoin problem as you see it? And I mean, some people would argue it's not a problem, but you can take that <laughs> from there. Yeah, it's, it's a very complex matter because ultimately in Bitcoin we're, we're talking about the energy intensive mining process and the thing there is that that's, that's something you can participate in anywhere in the world. So uh, we saw that previously a lot of that activity was taking place in China. China last year said, okay, we don't want this in our country anymore and uh, these miners are responsible for the revival of some of these idle coal mines that we have. So uh, uh, we're done with it, we, we're going to kick it out. And then the next thing we see happen is that a lot of those miners are indeed migrating to places like uh, Kazakhstan, but also here in the US. And uh, as a result of that, we even see the carbon intensity of the network going up even further. So you can say, well, ban ban banning crypto uh, mining in one place is, is probably not the right solution, but then you can really wonder uh, what, what is the right solution. And it's, it's, it's really tough to come up with an ultimate answer that put it, because of what I just said. It's something that you can ultimately do in every household. Everyone can put a Bitcoin mining device in their own house. And uh, I wish you good luck with cracking down on that if you're a government. <laughs> Are we going? to raid everyone's homes? I don't think so. Um, so it's, it's, it's really tough and I think one of the first steps that we need to take is how we have a lot of approaches to measure the carbon impacts of these systems and I specialize in that but uh, a lot of people don't realize that 
in order to hold people accountable, we also need to have carbon accounting standards, and we don't even have those at the moment. There is no carbon accounting standard for this space, and we just heard scope 3 emissions, but what, what kind of emissions are we supposed to allocate to whom? That's still a question that is unanswered. So I think a logical next step would be to start developing these frameworks and make sure that we can, we can hold people accountable, and I, yeah, we should be taking it from there. Another shameless plug, that was actually the motivation behind, behind CESA that was founded at the WEF. Like, we do need to form these standards, right? And we need uh, everybody at the table. It just can't be the crypto community. You've got to have energy companies and everybody else. And so I think that's a really, a really important point, like this base understanding about what we're actually measuring and what we're, we're taking on. But let's stick with this. Um, Steve, you know, as, as a member of the C-suite of Ethereum Inc. Sorry, that's a joke. Uh, consensus. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, you know... Obviously, the migration uh, to, to proof of stake is is a critical part of, of I think you know the Ethereum community's um, efforts to. to, to I'll, I'll answer. It. I'll, I'll answer. Yeah, it go before ahead. you ask it. Okay, go it, ahead. It's, <laughs> the answer is it's not enough. Okay. And and that's the most important point I can I can urge my colleagues who have any relationship. Uh, Falcon has a wonderful relationship to the Ethereum community is that proof of stake isn't enough. I, I talk to my colleagues on the engineering side and they say, they speak as engineers, well, we've fucking solved it, right? I mean, <laughs> what else do you want? Right, yeah. And, 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 and in the carrot and stick of it all, we've just heard from the stick, because as yeah. close to the stick as exists in our space it's is Digiconomy. It is. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and he is the measure. And, and now this UCL thing has just come up, which is interesting. Uh, and and, and we, we've taken the time to rerun those UCL numbers, and, and they're interesting numbers. The, I would say, I, I, I'd say this. Number one, proof of stake is not enough. It's just the beginning. Number two, we need to take pages from each other's books. Uh, I, I take a page from the Microsoft book. I think uh, Brad and, and Lucas uh, deserve a tremendous amount of credit, uh, and I, I do think it actually probably starts with Bill Gates, um, who, for all the goodies he has in the world, we can actually give him a little more credit even than that, which is to say, I, I think the leadership to declare Microsoft that we are not just going to clean up our current footprint, but we are going to clean up our historical footprint, mm. uh, I, I think is a movement that, that I think should be credited probably as, to some degree starting at Microsoft and needs to permeate everywhere, including the crypto community. Um, so proof of stake is just the beginning. I think we have to look at what, you know, what, what we've wrought and take responsibility for it as, quote, stewards and, and, and address it. As a company, we're going about it in a variety of ways. Uh, we have the, the full intention, and I expect we will achieve it, of, of, of operating on a carbon zero basis starting this year, um, or, or carbon neutral space is the best we can achieve, I think, starting this year. But over time, uh, especially thanks to proof of stake, I think we can get there. We've run the UCL numbers. Interestingly, I, I know that was a sort of blip in the press. Um, I think they actually proved 99.5, that we're going to get to 99.5 if, if we use their numbers, uh, which is great, but that's going to leave 0.5% of friggin' Netherlands. Mm. So we've, we still have something to do on a go-forward basis. We are working with the UNFCCC in... Weirdly enough, the Paris Accords are based in Bonn. Welcome to the New World. And um, we work very closely with them in a variety of areas where we think blockchain can make a difference. One is uh, in greening the green bond space. Green bonds is a source of cheap financing. It was $500 billion in financing last year, $300 billion the year before. It's not greening anything. So uh, our, our goal is to work on... Uh, as you, you know, we do a lot of work in the sort of fintech space. Uh, one, one of the fintech projects is going to be to work to see if, what we can do to help green the green bond space. Uh, another project that we're working on is we have built a, uh, a carbon credits on blockchain trading system. Um, 
it, Toucan was mentioned. Toucan is a terrific organization. I can say that Toucan got its first money from the uh, Blockchain Social Impact Coalition, which, which Consensus helped to launch. I was actually on the uh, hackathon committee that gave Raphael his first money. Nice. Toucan became Toucan. It's great. Mm -hmm. So you figured out how to move what is a data-based financial asset, a carbon credit, and move it over into, onto our ledgering system, which is, which is a great beginning. We're, we're looking to sort of now uh, automate the trading side of all of that. And, and, and thirdly, we're looking to play uh, our part as, theory of me, nice joke, but the, the truth is we, uh, you know, J Joe Lubin, uh, uh, who I have the uh, privilege to work with, uh, sees his role both in a business and uh, a movement of sorts. And uh, obviously I take that uh, pretty seriously. I think we have the opportunity to go from laggards to leaders in this space. This precisely this year, because you can't clean other people's houses till you cleaned up your own. And I think after POS, we have an opportunity to be the, the leaders for the first time. We, sh we, we, well, we need to be. You're doing a good job of, the, again, making me rethink my, my direction of this <laughs> narrative here every time Steve is like... And you're freaking MIT, man. <laughs> I barely got out of high school. That's right. Can't keep, can't keep to the script. Uh, and, and the thing that suddenly got my attention there was you referenced Microsoft and its own corporate commitment, right? And uh, if Paul Brody, who was going to be here, were here, he would be jumping up about this, right? Because there is... Paul talks about how much treasury money is sitting at responsible companies like Microsoft and Apple and others that is absolutely committed to these zero carbon targets, right? They don't know whether to put it. They don't know how to put it. They, they're desperate to find assets that can return this, this need. Good. Well, let's hear, hear from you at the, at the, at the end. We'll get some questions. That'd be great. Um, and, and so, like, and I think one of the things that Paul, you know, has been interested in exploring, you know, is how do we take the the flywheel effect of speculation and energy that really is DeFi and crypto, right? It's about making money. And how do you sort of tie that, align that with this, this huge investment possibility? Because we need trillions of dollars of investment to, to, to get the world into a safe space. So thoughts on that. Like how do we take crypto, what crypto is really good at, <laughs> Bunch of things, but what it's, its first use case is speculation, right? It's done a really good job of driving speculation. How do we align that with investing in, in, in you know, what we need as a planet? Go for it, yeah. I think that's a great question, also. You have a knack for asking, like, tough, good questions. Um, I, uh, I'm talking to, like, a couple folks who are more on the Web2 side of things, and you know, the, when you bring the carbon markets on chain, of course, there's like, you know, upgrades in market efficiency and that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, a lot of the solutions are around like, how do you sort of almost leverage the current price or the future price of carbon to then find like the carbon initiative to go get the credit and that kind of thing. Um, and that's something that I'm still kind of sitting with because as you said, sort of on the speculative angle, I mean, that's effectively just trading carbon futures uh, leveraged. Um, and, and who loses out on that? So that's, that's definitely something that we need to think about a lot more as an industry. I mean, I think there's too much speculation in DeFi, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, well, I suppose like, maybe to you, Adam, like, like um, how, do we make these, how do we make real assets on chain investable, right? As opposed to you know, speculating on carbon credits and the like. Like the, the idea that we'll take, and we saw some presentations before about like, you know, provable renewable energy and, and the like, right? Um, some of the work that you guys have been looking into, how do we take these things and make them investable? Ooh, that's a hard one. That's a, yeah. Um, the, uh, I, don't, I don't have a, a great answer for that. I can tell you some of the things that uh, we are investing in uh, that, are, that are real. Um, uh, things like uh, uh, investing in hydrogen backup uh, for all of our uh, data centers. Right, and that's a thing that, uh, from an investment standpoint, um, if if you were if you were looking for the the, the biggest bang for your buck early, uh, that one won't do it by itself. It requires a large investment to get to the scale where where that can uh, that can be sustainable long term. 
So it's things, uh, things of that nature. We're, we're invested in, uh, in uh, low-carbon avgas. We're invested in uh, carbon capture technologies. Right? All of these things uh, need to come together in order to bring us to a, to a lower carbon future. And all of them need to be jump-started. And so that's something that, that, that we are actively investing uh, in. And none of this is secret. This is all on our, uh, on our website. Um, but, uh, but yeah, th those are things that, uh, that we need participation from the, the community at large as well uh, to help push, push them forward. Yeah, I mean, that everything needs to come together aspect here, right? You can do it all very well to be focusing on making proof, you know, bringing Ethereum into proof of stake, for example, but in the meantime, what's happening in the rest of the world and how do we pull it all together? Steve, yeah. If, if I may, um, I, I think Doug pointed us to, uh, to something very much, as he does, in, in the right direction, which is real-time monitoring of energy use. It is a perfect, I mean, you know, it, even people who know just a little bit about the blockchain, and, and it's, uh, ask Sheila knows well, the, the relationship, and she knows a lot about it, the relationship of blockchain to supply chain. Anybody who knows anything about blockchain understands that we need to, we could be the architect of real-time data in, of, in, around energy use. We don't have to create the ESG movement. The ESG movement is here. It may not be everything we want it to be, but it's already leagues ahead of where it was a few years ago. So if you combine the current momentum toward ESG with real-time data, real-time data, not the once a year that, uh, that Alan was talking about, the once a year offsetting, but if it's done real time, you've really transformed the place in a, in a huge way that takes us way further toward 1.5 than we are now. So I'd say if I were gonna focus investment in one area, it would be on real time verification and reporting of energy use using Web3 and, uh, and then leave the forces of business and, you know, you, the coin, you're, you're, it's interesting, the Coinbase answer was, could we productize this? Well, that's the right answer, because everybody <laughs> needs to do the thing they Thank do you. to contribute. <laughs> and if Coinbase could productize it, and consensus could build some infrastructure, and DigiEconomist can keep us honest, and Microsoft <laughs> can show the corporate world what, what, uh, what a serious commitment looks like, we're each doing the thing we do to, to get us there. And, um, and I think we can make a big difference when, to meeting again next year and sort of looking at what we accomplished in 22. Please go, Charles. Yeah, uh, you know, I want to get back to something I heard previously. Like, well, a key question is, how do we make something real on top of a blockchain? And, you know, I previously worked at a uh, audit and consulting company. And a, a lot of the initiative I saw coming by was like, can we do something like carbon credits on top of a blockchain? That, that's, that's, that's something I, I used to hear a lot. And, uh, well, the, the reason why that's being thought about is in the context of carbon offsets. Carbon offsets are uh, unfortunately quite often counted uh, more than once, uh, once by the seller, once by the buyer. And if you have this double counting going on, people sometimes think, hey, double spending, that's something I heard in the context of blockchain. So maybe that, that can help out. Um, but, you know, one of, one of the, the, the key challenges we, we saw there was that, okay, you know, you can do carbon credits on top of a blockchain, but, you know, ultimately, who's going to check that trees are being planted? Like, who's going to tell the blockchain there are that many trees being planted in that area? Um, hey, you're going to have to rely on some kind of trusted source of input for that, uh, which, by the way, as auditors, we thought that was great because that was our core business. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, I think this is a very, uh, you know, key question you should be thinking about and, and, and can even make you wonder, like, okay, what's, what is still the added value of a blockchain if we're going to rely on auditors? Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's another Good segue because the um, you know it's often referred to as the last mile problem you know or the garbage in garbage out problem the on-chain data is, is is trustworthy but how do you bring off-chain data in um, but there's a lot of work going on in this space right there's a lot of you know trusted computing stuff there's like all sorts of satellite imaging solutions there's there's all sorts of things and and I do think personally that yeah props to your pr prior profession you know auditors are going to play a key role in this but they've just got to become 
up to date on, uh, on, on what is needed by you know, a, a decentralized uh, distributed system. But maybe to you, Adam, because you, know, you are looking at things like um, you know, scope three emissions and the like and measuring supply chain impacts. How do you deal with the problem that you know, Alex was referring to there of, okay, we got a really good double spend uh, uh, check here, but how do we know that the data is, is to be trusted? Oh, that's, that is the hardest problem to solve, right? Um, and uh, I can't say that we have a solution for it yet, but what I'm hoping is that by having actual transparency uh, to it, then we can bring the liability for that audit higher up in the chain, up, up to a place where, where, A, they can afford to have those audits, but also they can perform those audits in a, um, uh, in a manner where, uh, um, where the, uh, the liability for, um, uh, uh, for the, the, sorry, the liability for uh, negative impacts of those audits, right, aren't actually um, uh, masked by the, the folks who are, who are paying for the audit. So, um, I, generally speaking, uh, that's what we hope, but it is not a, uh, an easy problem at all. Any, any thoughts on, on this, Harrison? I mean, I, I was struck by, in a completely different context, um, uh, um, the fact that the, the, the hacker of the DAO was, was, was caught six years <laughs> later, right? And, and one of the messages, you know, Laura Shin, I don't know if you've read the book, but um, I'm not sure that Joe was necessarily advising people to read her book, Steve, but uh, she... <laughs> he did in Denver. He did? Oh, good for him. Good for him. It is a great book. But she, she, you know, the work that she did after it just demonstrated once again that ultimately on the blockchain there's nowhere to hide. And, and to me, that strikes me as possibly an answer to this problem, right? Because you will get caught eventually. There, there, isn't a tra there is a transparency and a traceability that makes it harder, at least, to hide. So I don't know if you've thought through any of that and you know, how you go about what your strategy is with regards to the data problem. What I keep coming back to, and we've talked about sort of like verification, like how do you make sure that the tree's been planted and haven't been cut down once they have been planted. But um, the thing that I keep coming back to is that so many of these solutions are effectively trading on the future price of carbon to finance the current sort of reforestation or afforestation project. Um, and in some respects, I mean, you know, blockchain is magic internet money, and so they could just fork Ethereum and after the DAO hack, but you can't do that with the climate. So, you know, it's, it's an incredibly hard problem. Um, well, no thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, uh, but, but one thought is satellites, of course. I mean, if, yeah, you, if yeah. you choose in 1962 could see a single missile on the Cuban island, then satellites today can count trees, and it's just a matter of connecting to the data. I think I, I, I could be incredibly naive. You're all way ahead of me in, like, science class, but, but I have to believe this is possible. Well, the, um, you know, the, the organic in, uh, industry had a similar problem. How do you validate that something was grown organically? And uh, what they ended up doing was, was uh, exactly what Michael uh, was alluding to, where with enough data, you can prove it. And so essentially, rather than uh, relying on audits of the field of all time to make sure that there's no chemicals there that shouldn't be there, which, which there are audits, uh, the majority of the data comes from how much water was, a, was applied to those plants and, uh, and, and what was the amount of produce that came out, right? And with uh, uh, fertilizers that shouldn't be there, you can see how those things don't add up. Right, and that same that that is uh, absolutely going to be true in our industries as well. Right, with enough data, we should be able to correlate uh, whether people are actually following these practices or not. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's that whole sort of almost ecosystem-wide big data approach to things that sort of you know, if we think if we're focused on the endpoint, yeah, it, it it can be gained, right? But this once you've got a, a bigger picture, it's, it becomes much harder to hide. So I think we. Opening up to questions, is that the plan here? Angie, um, what's our, uh, is there a toilet? Yeah, we've got a little bit of time if you're 10 minutes. 10 minutes, sense. yeah, I was think we're wrapping up in 10 minutes, right? So Thanks, Pete. Uh, you wanted to no, offer up some idea, yeah. Quick question. Um, I, uh, I grew up in Austin, grew up in an oil and gas family. I'm one of the few, few oil and gas people that believes in climate change. So 100% <laughs> believe in sustainability. Uh, I'm one of the founders of Pump Jack Power. We're a, we are a power provider here in the ERCOT market. 
We recently just spun out a company called Crypto Power, the first and only power provider powering the blockchain. Outside of what the blockchain does stabilizing the ERCOT grid, a question I have to you guys is of how you view sustainability. I just helped a uh, mining group basically build a mining facility at a natural gas plant. They are essentially taking the CO2 produced from that gas plant and recycling it to cool their, their operations. So I think from a standpoint of, I love green energy, I, I totally believe solar, battery, wind in the right markets, nuclear long term, but our, our approach, my question is, in terms of you know, not demonizing fossil fuels, how can large operators look at natural gas or some type of fossil fuel situations and approach them with sustainability solutions? Anybody want to take that? I'm not smart enough to come up with a constructive answer. <laughs> I'm wildly unqualified. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> the, the, the thing is, uh, when, when we look at Bitcoin miners and, and you know, there's, there's so many different examples of how they're using energy and, and one of those examples is, uh, the, the one popular uh, one recently is uh, they've been using uh, gas that would otherwise be flared and they're saying okay uh, this is uh, good for the environment uh, we're reducing emissions that way well um, that's certainly not true because you're still combusting the gas to generate electricity so ultimately the efficiency of that should be more or less the same but you can you can still make the argument that well in any case you know whether we're going to flare it or we're going to combust it for generating electricity for Bitcoin mining, at least the impact is the same, how we're not worsening any impact. Um, and you can actually think of that as a, as a great argument, and let, but the only issue is that how we, we're also seeing a lot of initiatives right now to just completely uh, prohibit uh, routine flaring. Huh? There is a zero routine flaring initiative hoping to end flaring uh, altogether by 2030. New Mexico recently uh, decided just last year to uh, prohibit flaring as of 2026, so uh, companies are going to be required to capture the gas uh, instead of flaring it. And you know, if you're capturing it, you can also use it to displace some kind of other fossil fuel source, so in that case, you're, hey, you're not making things worse, but you could have used that captured gas to make things better. <laughs> so it's, a, it's, 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 it's really difficult to, uh, to, 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 you know, it's, there are so many different examples, and yeah, and this, this is one where you can make that argument, okay, at least it does no harm, but if you look a bit further, then it still doesn't look too great. If I can go rogue for a second, um, Doug is still in the room. Uh, green hash rate solution, can you just uh, take one minute and describe what some Bitcoin folks are doing around what they call the green hash rate solution? Sure, can you hear me okay? You still got a mic. Yeah. Oh, okay. Make sure he gives it back. <laughs> hey Paige, get it back from him before he goes. So I mean essentially the idea is to um, position, help, crypto, help Bitcoin miners power themselves with renewable energy certificates and then use that as a way to establish the them, a green credential for themselves as a miner. So the miner can say, I am renewably powered. I should get this credential that's assigned to me. And then if you look at a Bitcoin mining pool, you can say, okay, what, per, what proportion of the miners in this pool have this credential assigned to them? And it could be that the entire pool is green, in which case you could say, you know, all Bitcoin mined from this pool are green powered and maybe you attract ESG investors, and et cetera. Um, or it could just be individual miners and they just want to show the proportion of that pool that's verified green where what that then means is if, you buy, if you're buying clean power, the scope to carbon emissions, the electricity use is zero for those miners. So they've gone from whatever the grid mix is to zero, and that's the carbon mitigation. Which is a carrot and a stick. It's yeah. a carrot because I get to say I'm, I meet proof of green. It's a stick because I'm not going to buy or, in, or, or in, interact with coins that don't get the proof of green yeah. stamp. And, so and the it one works on add, both levels. The one thing to add to it, too, is why it's so exciting to look at crypto solutions for this is the whole mantra, of course, is verify, don't trust. Right now, the way the sector works is companies say, I'm 100% clean powered, and it's in my books, but you can't see my books. This is a way to use you know, the, the space to actually confirm that they are 100% covered, we're good to go, and then it, it actually verifies it. It's not just taking somebody's word for it. So I'm just going to like again use my moderator's uh, prerogative here <laughs> and just to say a couple of comments, because I've thought and written quite a bit about this. Um, I think the, the gas flaring thing is, is, you're absolutely right, there's really no net 
gain, it's you're still ultimately still producing that gas. So the question is, you know, how do we actually make you know, net renewable additional uh, uh, energy solutions become attractive to Bitcoin miners, right? And, and, that, and that takes investment, and we know that solar isn't going to be as efficient as some of these things. But it doesn't mean that there isn't a math model out there that could make this work if there were to be, you know, uh, various other incentives. And so grid managers and other policy managers in energy, I think, have a real opportunity here. And Texas has done some interesting things. I'm not sure they've gotten it quite right, given the problems they had a year ago. But th there is some really interesting models, right, where Bitcoiners are, Bitcoin miners are, are paid to turn off their mines when there is a spike in, in, in energy. So the, the management of the duck curve problem and all these things, the role that Bitcoin miners could play in all that, to be partners with you know, local energy producers and think about this from this ecosystem perspective, right? This, this is about all the different pieces coming together rather than, you know, I, I think these, these, these pools being provably green is great, Doug, but there's also the other side of it. It's like, oh, how do we actually work together collectively? Because Bitcoin isn't going away, right? So taking it out of Kazakhstan, incentivizing it into these models is it, whether it's, you know, local small hydro uh, farms or wind farms or whatever it is. There's, there's the capacity now to actually earn money in the most remote places. There's business opportunities that come with that, with Bitcoin, and there's, there's models that can be built around it. So I think there's, there's a higher level conversation that needs to happen rather than just the technicals. Amanda, you had your hand up. Before Ethereum 2 comes in place, what are your thoughts on other ways we can make NFTs uh, more sustainable? Is it carbon offsetting? Is that enough? Other thoughts on that? Yeah, we haven't mentioned NFTs. Um, I, I run um, Metagood. Uh, Metagood, which has on-chain monkey. We are all on-chain in a single tra um, Ethereum transaction, which is slightly better for the environment. We're still running on ETH, so we're trying to think of, as we work with other collections, what else can we be doing to be more sustainable as an NFT collection? Maybe, maybe. Yeah. you know, uh, in in one minute. <laughs> now the, the 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 thing with NFTs is that you know they're an application, and you have a choice where you want to build that application. So you can either run it on Ethereum, or you can use, run it on some other platform that's already running on proof of stake, like Ethereum is planning to do. Um, and e even if you're building on Ethereum, you can be like, okay, they're going to switch to proof of stake pretty soon. So uh, in in instead of uh, trying to avoid Ethereum, maybe we should, you know, uh, for the well-being, try to do carbon offsetting, at least if Ethereum really, uh, they, they do have to succeed in making that change to proof of stake happen, but uh, that could be a som somewhat intermediate uh, solution for the coming months. Uh, and then there's also an option to use uh, uh, layer two solutions. There's Polygon, uh, which still works together with Ethereum, so the carbon footprint is <laughs> uh, still a thing, but uh, less of an issue than it is if you're running on Ethereum directly. So there's a choice you can make there. Steve, final word, we've got the countdown clock. Oh, great, yeah, no, just one quick thing. Uh, I mean, for you, for you specifically, uh, Amanda, that when we built Palm, uh, launched the Palm NFT blockchain, First of all, it was built on IBFT. It's a conversation we can have, but, but a pretty clean uh, chain, the Palm Network. But, but we actually, I, thi I think of Coinbase as being a sort of first cousin to uh, Andreessen. And Andreessen has a project called uh, Patch. And we integrated Palm with Patch. So we're belt and suspenders. We not only work on a clean chain, but we offset through Patch. We're exploring that too. Credit, cre credit to AH. Yeah. Okay, on that note, Thank I think you. we've run out of time. Um, thank you very much for this tremendous panel. Round of applause. <laughs>